Okay, what spiritual doctrine did they adhere to? Were they mystics or were they just soldiers? Or did they have a spiritual doctrine or discipline, should I say? Uh, some of the original Shriners belong to what they refer to as the Khalwati order of the Mutasawwaf or Sufis. And they were from the Masjid al-Ali, which in English becomes the Temple of Ali. And that was in uh, Shurq al awsit or Saudi Arabia. Years ago, the family of the Prophet Muhammad called Ahl al-Bayt. So they had a mystical order of Sufis. Now, when you go back to the Torah or the Old Testament, you find out that these men are referred to as the Essenes. When you go back to Persia, amongst the uh, Farsiya, or they become known as the Magus or the Magi. So they always did have a secret doctrine. And their secret doctrine you find in the books of Job, uh, you find in the books of Job 9, especially because they're talking about the constellations of the stars. And they use uh, four major stars there. They use the Orion star constellation called Kisil. Uh, they use Arcturus, Plateus, and then they use Mesaris. And the word Mesaris translates as the 12 signs of the zodiac. You follow? So the original travelers by across the desert would use the stars as our guide to lead us from oasis to oasis to town to town to village to village and so they did have a doctrine and that doctrine has been borrowed by the Greeks and Latin and watered down became known as astrology and uh, what do you call it zodiac today but they did have a doctrine the Magus in fact Jesus' son, Simeon Bar Jesus, as meant found in Acts, he was also a part of the order. And they called him a Magus, if you read the books of Acts, right? Because he belonged to the brotherhood. When Miriam, or Mary, was about to deliver, she had three men. Each of those men were leading a company of 15 men when you do research. Into Egypt, you get the story from the Coptic church, because the brother of Jesus called James, his real name was Yaakov, took the real teachings of Jesus into Egypt and back to the village where Mary was when he was a child, amongst the Hendendawa or the bigger people. When you go back and study that, you find things that they didn't record or that the Nicaeans or those councilmen of Nicaean took out of the Bible, took out certain books. And that's why if you look at the Catholic Bible, and then look at the King James Version of the Bible, you find the King James Version only has 66 books, and the Catholic Bible has 72 books. And this is it today, because the Catholic Bible was the original Bible, because the Roman Catholics, because Constantine was the first Roman to convert to Christianity. And the Bibles that people are holding today, like we use, the King James Version was taken from the Tinsdale Version, which was taken from the Wycliffe version which was done in German before it was even brought to English and then books were stolen and moved around and translations confused and words moved and for instance the very word God in Genesis was altered from a pluralization to an infinite that's why they say uh, in the beginning God it leaves it where that could be God's one two three four five when you look at the word God so there was a mystical doctrine there were secrets that were kept uh, and protected. Certain things that the brotherhood protected, right? Uh, about the family of Jesus, about the crucifixion of Jesus, about the life and whereabouts of Mary after Jesus. Uh, Jesus had what they refer to as sacred disciples, like uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And these individuals belonged to a sacred brotherhood of which Lazarus was initiated in. Okay, just to jump around a little. So we do have the wise men who were from a Persian chapter that came over to see the child that was born, actually to protect him. If you really read the Bible close, had not the wise men got there and told Joseph and Mary what to do, then Jesus might have died before he got baptized and received the power of God. Because the reality is that if Jesus had to leave Jerusalem and go to Egypt because Herod wanted to kill him, then the reality is he could die then. 
So he had to wait till he got to the point where he received the power of God, which was done by St. John the Baptist, who baptized him in age 29, where he received his godship, where he was invincible before, of course, the cross incident, as they put it, which, of course, part of the ritual is who was really on the cross? Did they really die on the cross? Did Jesus really marry? With the wedding of Canaan, whose wedding was that? All these things were held as secrets, but they recorded in Arabic. It wasn't put in other languages, and that's because Arabic preceded Hebrew, contrary to what most people believe. If you, uh, anybody has a Bible, and they open the books of Genesis to the 10th chapter, where they start giving you the genealogy coming down from Noah and them, you'll find that a person called Ashur was before a person called Aram. As you look in the Hebrew text, wherever they have, you know, Seretic, you'll see they have Aram. They switched it around. But the word Ashur became known as Seretic, and that's Syria, Surya, and the language then were in that area became known as Arabic. Let me make it clear. There's no such language Arabic became known as Arabic because the word Arabic in Arabic, Arabia, merely means to Ara, to roam from place to place. And when Ibrahim, or in Hebrew, Abraham, right, left uh, Or of Chaldea to cross the Tigris Euphrates to go over to Phoenicians, where they called him Ivri, or Hebrew, right, he was speaking Seretic. And they'll tell you, Lebanon was Assyrian, and that was Abraham's Nahar, Abraham's father's brother, Tyranim, was in Syria. Chaldea was considered Syrians. I don't want to lose you now. But that language, Arabic, existed first. This is why you have two different names in the Bible for God. One name being Yahweh or Jehovah, and the other name being Elohim. You follow? The word Yahweh or Jehovah is equivalent to when you say in Aramic, bar for son, as opposed to what you would say in Syretic, ben for son. So that's why you have two sons, bar Jesus, and then ben this, because two languages are running through the Bible. One of them is Syretic, or from Ashur, the oldest son, and the other is Aramic, which became known as Hebrew. Yahweh, or Jehovah, is a Hebrew name. But the word Elohim is the plural for Elo or Ila or Allah, which is ancient Ashuric or an Arabic name. You follow that? Jesus spoke Arabic. And that's why Jesus in the New Testament didn't call on Yahweh. He said Eli. He used the word Ila. Eli, Eli, Lama Thabakthani. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Because Jesus was a Nazarite, and he lived in Galilee. And the Galileans spoke Arabic, which you read in Acts when they start talking about the speaking in tongues. When you do a research, you find out that most of those tongues or languages they were speaking was different variations of Arabic, Syria, Egypt, and such. So Jesus in himself spoke a form of Arabic as well as he did understand uh, the Nazarite dialect and Aramic, but his key language was Arabic, that's why he used the word Eli and not Jehovah when he was on the cross. And throughout the Bible you find men that have Eli in their name or El in their name dealing with the Ashuric side of the family which came down to Abraham to Ishmael. See how that went? Now you notice the Arabic verbs in their roots are all three parts. You should notice in the grammar of that language, all their root verbs are three parts. Like if they was going to give you the root word for book, it would be ke te be. You know what I'm saying? What's going to be read is kara a. Three parts. Sit, jala, se. So now, when you get to the name for Abraham, you get Abraham. Avram. Or Ibrahim. When you get to his son by Hekat, which is Hagar, it becomes Ishmael. Correct? But the other son, they had to give him an Arabic name and move from the Aramic to the Ashuric. You follow that? Because that's how the name comes. 
Yeshua. That's Jesus in Hebrew. Yeshua. It's three parts. You follow? So the shrine, the original shrines were formed out of the families of the prophet from Amr, right? Who became known as Hashem. And we get the word Hashemi, which is assassins who were protecting the pilgrims, as I said many times, who were on their way into the holy city of Becca. I'm stressing Becca with a B because there's no city in the Arabic of the Quran called Mecca. This is a mistake done when they translated or took it from handwritten scripts from the original Arabic, which was a form of Farsi script that you see in the Quran today, and they translated and a mim or meme got mixed up with a be because there was no nukat. The word nukat means dots. There was no nukat. There was no dots on the Arabic. There was no fatha, no kasra, no dhamma, no slashes or vowels originally. So they really couldn't tell. It depend on the calligrapher. So someone made a mistake when they were taking this Quran and not translating it, but inscribing it from the dialect of the Quraysh in Arabia over to Farsi, where Ali radiallahu anhu went to protect the Quran against the Caucasian groups of Sunni Muslims under Abu Bakr and his daughter Aisha, who were trying to take over Islam, who formed Sunni Islam to oppose Shia Islam, the Islam of Muhammad and Ali's family. So while he was protecting the Quran, they had to take it and put it in a language or script that they couldn't read, and that script became known as Kufic because they did it in a place called Kufr, and the letters got shifted. Now people are going to Mecca, when in actuality, that word Mecca is not in the Quran in Arabic. When you look at an English translation, you may see it, and then you look at a commentary, they explain, well, that's a mistake. The city is called Becca. Well, Becca was a center of trade and wealth, and the family of the Quraysh, or Muhammad's own family, were those responsible for protecting that city. So Muhammad's uncle named Hamza, who was a descendant from Hashem, decided to put together a band of men called Hashemiyah or assassins, and they dressed in all black. They depicted them in the Raiders of the Lost Ark. They thought they were being funny, and they also depicted them in um, Jewel of the Nile, when they show you them all dressed in black with red sashes, or the guy who runs up on the mound and switches the sword, and he just turns around and politely shoots him. Remember that incident? Well, that man with the black mask on, the black emma or turban, and the black robe and red sash belonged to the Sacred Brotherhood of the Original Shrine. That was their traditional dress. You couldn't have had a Tarbush or a Fez if it originated in Saudi Arabia because the Tarbush and the Fez did not originate in Saudi Arabia. The Tarbush originated in Turkey and Egypt and Fez is a city called Fas in Morocco. So it couldn't have had a Fez as a dress, part of our original dress, if we originated in Arabia during the time of Ali, we would have been wearing the clothes that's in the Hadith and the Sunnah of Muhammad. Otherwise, we'd have been considered going against Islam. So Hamza was known to wear all black, and he took a band of blood relatives, young idle men, of course, and women amongst them to cook and prepare, and went out and surrounded Becca, or what's called Mecca, and set up camps out there, and they became known as the tribe of Kedar. Kedar was the second son of Ishmael, and means black tents. He said they were known to have these black tents. And anytime caravans were en route to Becca, if any uh, hoodlums or bandits would try to attack them to rob them of their spices or whatever they're transporting, then the tribe hems on them, would capture them, try them, and sentence them and execute them by, in most cases, beheading them. You follow? That became a fierce group of men. As years passed, let me jump some years, as the crusade came into play, then people had to protect the original city, where the Masjid al-Aqsar is, which is in Jerusalem, because Muslims had a vested interest in there, because in that city in Hebron was Ibrahim's mosque. Then they had the spot of the ascension where Ibrahim was challenged by the devil, which is the Dome of the Rock. All that was there. So. 
tribes from the Hashemi who are now incarnito, who don't walk around dressed in black image no more because we're way up to the 10th century now. They would go over there and they moved and lived amongst those people there and were trying to protect the shrines and the shriners. You follow that? Those people who went, shriners, meaning those people who went to worship at the shrine. So they would secretly protect them. Meanwhile, the Christians, on the other hand, had their own group. Their group were known as Knights Templar. They were influenced out of Spain first, out of a place called Alhambra or Seville, where they encountered Moors, and they're the ones who had the pheasants. They encountered the Moors, and the Moors taught them, and they were the Catholic order, and became known as Knights of Columbus. You follow that? And then their Islamic order became known as El Hamra. We know it was done by people who wasn't Arabs because they say Al Hamra, and the word is El Hamra ah, because it means the red house. You follow that? And the word is Hamra, not uh, not Hamra with a B. All right, these men were also paid large sums of money to go to Jerusalem to protect the holy sites while these people are fighting. Back then, they didn't have to worry too much about bombs. It was mainly to defend the temples and the priests against the rebels. What eventually happened is, here you are, a Knights Templar, and I am a Shriner, a Muslim Shriner, and we are both protecting the same building because the building is sacred to you <laughs> for Jesus and is sacred to me because of Abraham and Muhammad. Muhammad making his ascension called Isra over there. So now, we're there for the same reason. Eventually what happens is we start playing chess because we're idle. We're sitting there <laughs> and we start exchanging conversations and then we start discussing the scripture. And then these so-called Catholics, because there was no Baptists then, no Lutherans, started debating with the Muslims, and the Muslims with them, and they found out that they had more in common than they thought. They didn't know there was whole surahs or chapters in the Quran about Mary. They didn't know that was there and about her immaculate conception, and how Jesus was the Kalim Allah, the word of Allah, and the Ruhu Allah, and the spirit of Allah, and Jesus was exalted in this world and the hereafter, and Jesus spoke again. They didn't know that was in the Muslim doctrine. All they heard was the cry, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, and let's go kill people. So as they started to meet, then some of the Knights of Tablah became inquisitive about Islam, wanting to know more. They wanted to learn more about the prayer and the Adhan and the Iqama and the Muqtadi. And they tell them, well, before you do that, you got to take Shahada. Shahada is a word meaning bearing witness. You got to take Shahada that you worship one God and that God alone and have no partners with that God. And it's no big deal because they basically believe that. So they took Shahada and they started coming into the temple. It was allowed now in the masjids with the Muslims, as long as they respected it. They knew that they wasn't devout. Some of the Templar started learning the Arabic language and starting to read the Quran in the language. They became the original Shriners. The story that the Caucasians give about beating in a restaurant and all that stuff is something they made up. You follow? They became the original Shriners there. That's the first time Caucasians or non-Arabs were allowed to wear the symbol. You're right? and to be introduced to a small portion of the doctrine. They were given certain stories as symbols to test their loyalty. And they were given certain trials and certain what you might call examinations to see how firm they were before certain secrets could be passed on to them about the truth about Jesus and the truth about Mary and the truth about Judas. You follow? And some of these men took that oath. Eventually, the French Foreign Legion is formed. You follow what I'm saying? And these are supposed to be the French Orient who have now converted to Islam. And they're there protecting the deserts. Now they're converting from France, they're converting from Britain, they're coming in from Ireland, they're different ones. And they're basically Catholics, but they are adhering to the Islamic principles because they had the respect 
the Islamic law. You never put your foot up in front of a person. You never do this. When you meet a person, you say, Assalamu alaikum. They say, what does that mean? They said the same thing Jesus said in the upper room when he came and he said, peace be upon you. So, again, yeah, Assalamu alaikum. So that's how that ends up in the shrine of part of the doctrine. I can't go into the rituals, I can't tell you everything, but in certain in the rituals, certain stories are enacted that can be found in Sirat al-Islamiyah. In the history of Islam, you can find everything. You follow? And one of the things they did is the Caucasian ones got attached to a certain man called Qadir. Remember that jewel of the Nile? And he was going to try to rule everybody. Danny DeVito was in this, remember that? And they called him Qadir. He's trying to find the jewel or the stone of the Nile which is of course the black stone, which is not black, it's brown. <laughs> you have to see it to know it, which is another mistake. All right, so what happens is this man, Qadir, was a very powerful Sufi or a mystic, a fakir. When you use the word fakir, you're really saying a very poor person, right? And he had his own band of men who were like the Hashemiya. And the Caucasians admired him when he died they set up a ritual to reenact his death over and over again. The Caucasians in New York were invited to Algiers. First they visited Morocco for a party, then they visited Egypt for a party, and then they visited Algiers. While in Algiers, they went to a certain sultan's party. And at that sultan's party, they were enacting a play of a part of the history of Islam with Aisha. Aisha, one of the wives of the prophet and something she did wrong. They were enacting this play and this enactment became, a, it was like a mystical ritual for the brothers. These Caucasians were so overwhelmed by this play and this enactment that they brought it back to the United States in manuscripts poorly translated and set up their own ritual and formed what they called the shrine. Most of the Negroes who accepted their philosophy or petitioned to go to them had no idea that there was already a black shrine. You follow? People like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Noble Drew Ali, uh, Marcus Moses Garvey, all of these guys were tapped by a man called Dus Ali Muhammad or Dus Muhammad Ali of Egypt who belonged to the Egyptian shrine called Masjid al Hussein over at Khan Khalili and that's the Arab shrine in Egypt across the street from the University of Al Azhar and that's where those Arab shrine is made. A lot of American Negroes have no idea that we have an Arabic shrine, an ancient doctrine, ancient rituals. The thing they're holding in their hand is something that some Caucasians found a little bit of in their past and they're wondering where the, where the gap is at. What are we missing? I thought there was some secrets. Well, there is. They just don't have them because they got away from their own language. The first trick comes in is before you get into the shrine, you must be a... A Freemason? A Freemason. That means you have to be a free man, right? Free from... Free to... Huh? See, this is already assuming that everybody that wants to join was a slave. And if that's true, then how the Caucasians end up F and AM? Who freed them? The fact is that they were slaves because the actual word slave, as you know, means Slavic. And they were slaves to the Moors in Morocco and in Spain. You understand? And they were slaves to the Moors in Ireland and Scotland and Yorkshire in England, where you'll find crests to this very day with pictures of Moors on the family crest of all of those countries. Africans up there, Moors, you hear me? So a Moor cannot be freed because a Moor was never a slave. You have to understand that there was a treaty made between George Washington and Sidi Mohammed of Morocco when America was losing the battle for us to bring in ships from Morocco and to surround America and protect the shores. You can look this up. And you know what happened? Boats of Negroes came. You know what I'm saying? George Washington was surprised because they had already had Africans in slavery. 
and the men that came to protect America were Negroes called Morenos. There's no Arabic word for more. They were called Morenos. So what they did is they called the ones that were here from Africa by slave ships Negra or Negro or Negro. Guess where that comes from? That comes out of the Bible. In Acts chapter 13 verse 1. The word nigger is in your Bible. Simon, the brother of Jesus, is called nigger. And if you do some research under the word nigger in the Greek, you'll find out it means black-skinned person, which kind of tells you what Jesus really looked like, right in your Bible. You follow what I'm saying? So they called the ones that were slaves in America niggers or negroes. And they called the ones they respected Morenos or Morena. And then the ones who married in, they called Blackamoors. They were part African and part Moor. Now, any African who wanted to join a lodge who was in, in America, a slave, had first to be freed. He had to be free because you have to be a free man. <laughs> See? But the Moors didn't need to be free because we are the ones that initiated them and raised them and crossed them. We took them across the desert because they couldn't find their way from Saudi Arabia to Syria and from Syria over to Egypt. And it's a map of the constellation of Cirrus that's in the sky. And that's the symbol that the original Hashemites would use. They would draw a certain marking and that's where they say, and Jesus got down and marked something on the ground. That's a ritual symbol. You with me? So you had two groups now. You have the American Negroes who have been enslaved, accepted themselves as slaves. Then you had the Moors who came over here from Morocco. You follow that? Both of them are black as night, will not be here. And you can't free a Moor. Because of more has never been enslaved. That's why we here call ourselves United Nwapian Nation of Moors. And we demand that our sovereignty be recognized because we have a treaty that we made with George Washington that's in the archives and we can show it. And we can take our bloodline back and verify that you can't give me a charter from England. I gave you the charter, silly. You can't make me a shriner. Huh? You don't even know how to say Shriner in Arabic. They make the mistake with all the certificates to put the word Kubt, Kubba in Arabic. It's just not Kubba. A Kubba shrine is where a dead person is at. Now if you wait for me to give you the word, I'm not. Because that's one of the real sacred passwords. <laughs> that you have to find out in your own due time. You with me? So now you have this situation where you got slaves, niggers, and those who call themselves Negroes, and then a man called Prince Hall, who has a Caucasian father and a Barbadian French mother, who was also slave, right? But he had to be free. So therefore, they refer to his lodge as a African lodge. But Noble Juali, on the other hand, who went over to Egypt to study and into Morocco to study, came back and said, no, we are not Negroes. We are not colored people. We are not African Americans. The word Africa, Ifriqiya, means faraka, to divide up into pieces, to distinguish people from each other. It's not one of our words. That's not us. We're not African, or, right? We're not Negroes. We're not colored. In fact, Caucasians got more colors on them than we do. They got blue eyes and pink skin and speckled and red hair, some and brown hair, others and green hair and so much other stuff. Yeah, none of y'all are colored. So Nobu Ali came back and through him came out the Nation of Islam and they, they were trying to teach a form of Moorish doctrine and it got lost along the way when money took over the logic like in all situations and it went dormant you follow me